All right, we're keeping an eye on Coca-Cola this morning because the soft beverage giant raised its outlook thanks to continued strong sales. Stock a little bit lower right now because that boost overshadowed by an unexpected decline in unit case volume in the third quarter. Joining us now to unpack is John Murphy. He is the CFO of Coca-Cola. And I'm so excited to talk about this. Of course, we have such a focus on the economy right now. And I think this is a really interesting sign of the time. So we're going to talk about price. We're going to talk about volume. Let's start with volume because your total unit case volume down about 1% in the quarter. What levers do you have to pull? How do you boost volume at this juncture? So we, we did have a decline in the quarter, but I'd, I'd highlight the decline was primarily driven by some anomalous factors in July. Sequentially, we improved through the quarter. And in this particular quarter, thanks to our developed economies, uh, we, we came out towards the end of the quarter uh, in pretty good shape. And as we go forward, the, the name of the game is to get back to the more balanced growth equation that we've enjoyed in the last few years, and that is getting the developing emerging economies uh, back to where they had been. And we expect to see that happening throughout the next uh, six to nine months. And uh, definitely want to get to the international view, but let's talk a little bit about pricing here because your price mix, this is the prices that you charge across a range of your products. It increased 10% in the quarter. And I found that really interesting because not a lot of companies have pricing power left at this point. But how much more can your consumers handle when it comes to raising prices again? So that price mix number is, uh, is, is for sure, it's an interesting headline number. When you get underneath it, there's three factors you've got. You know, normal pricing, about 3 to 4 percent. We have pricing that comes from some of our hyperinflationary environments, another 4 percent or so. And then in this particular quarter, we got the benefits from uh, the mixed impact of our more profitable markets performing better. So as we look to the next phase of the, of the journey ahead, uh, you know, we see pricing moderating more in line with, with the CPI headlines here in the United States. And, and typically around the world, that's our, that's our approach also. We're also investing heavily in our brands to, uh, to sustain their, their relevance. And um, through our various revenue growth strategies, uh, offering both affordability and premium options to uh, consumers for the occasions that they are seeking. I wonder about... Um your calorie-less drinks and how much the impact of WeGovi and Ozempic has had on the product mix. Are you selling more, uh, you know, just plain water or uh, flavored seltzers and less of the more sugary drinks? Well, we've had a, for the last number of years, we've, we've seen trends towards lower zero-calorie products across the portfolio here in the U.S. and, and elsewhere. We're not seeing a material impact yet in our data on Ozempic and, and similar types of, uh, of medications. So uh, our, our goal is to follow the consumer. We have a terrific innovation pipeline. Uh, we continue to invest, I think, ahead of the curve on the lower zero calorie because uh, around the world that's, uh, that's what consumers are looking more for and we're, we're going to be there to, to provide them. John, I want to double down on Katie's earlier question a little bit here because it looks like that's what investors are really latching on to. Because on first blush for a company, you would think that being able to raise prices as you have, despite everyone else not being able to, that that would be a good thing. But the worries here rely around customers buying more, ultimately. So if you project out through the next year, how do you expect consumers to behave under this higher price scenario? So... At the highest level, we see continued consumer spending at, at the levels that we're seeing at the moment and growing pretty much in line with GDP expectations, which low single digit uh, at the global level. I, I think what's really important though is to get underneath that, to understand your consumer customer base at a much more granular level, and then to be able to apply the appropriate um, solutions that we have uh, in, in our portfolio, offering affordability in where that's, where that's important. There's a, a lower income segment in the United States, for example, where we're offering a one and a quarter litre 
package is growing uh, at, at double digit rates. We have um, premium solutions too for the occasions where that, where that works. So I think the name of the game is going to be adapting to those more granular segments. But at the highest level, we see continued resilience and continued growth in consumer spending uh, around the world. And John, I want to talk about the competitive landscape and potential M&A coming from Coca-Cola because you think about this craze around healthier sodas, you think of Poppy, you think of Olipop, for example. Would Coca-Cola be open to buying one of those brands, partnering with one of those brands? What might that look like? Yeah, we're always, we're always open to new opportunities that are out there. But right now we have a portfolio of $28 billion brands that we think represents a tremendous amount of headroom for us over the next couple of years. So our primary focus today is to continue to invest and grow the brands that we own. And you, know, you always have to stay opportunistic. You always have to keep your eyes open. And if something more attractive than what we currently have comes along, we'll be open to look at it. I wonder about the uh, geopolitical risks out there, John. You know, uh, we focus so much on interest rates and inflation, the labor market. And we cover, you know, the war in Ukraine and the war in the Middle East as general news, but we don't hear much about them from business leaders until last night we heard from a private equity company that uh, they are concerned more about geopolitics than anything else. Do you see any effect of that on your business? Is it significant? Well, you know, operating in over 200 countries around the world, it would be hard to not have uh, an implied effect from what's happening in the geopolitical world. And I That's think, why I ask you. you know, as, we, as James and I have uh, highlighted, you know, the, we, we have a, an all-weather approach to not just the geopolitical pieces, but the macroeconomics as well. And I think the name of the game is to, is to stay very close to what's coming and to be in a position with our bottling partners around the world to, to adapt. So, yes, you know, if, if you look at the situation in the Ukraine, yes, it had an impact on the way we go to market and the markets we're in. But uh, with our partners, we, we adapt and uh, we continue to see the, a global portfolio being the best one for us to be in. And John, quickly, before we let you go, I am really curious about how you're thinking about marketing at this juncture. Of course, we had that long discussion about price to volume. How much, when it comes to your resources, are you dedicating to marketing spend? So marketing is at the core of our ability to create value for both, both our consumers and for ourselves. And uh, one of the lessons we've learned through COVID, post-COVID, and as we go into next year is to is to stay consistent, to stay investing behind your brands. I think what's, what's, what's important though is to understand the, uh, the, the mix of the investments that you make. Uh, we're, we're particularly keen to ensure on the marketing front that we're leveraging new technologies, we're leveraging new capabilities to, uh, to stay close to consumers in the digital world, for example. And, and so it's a hugely important piece of our growth equation and will be for, I think, forever, actually. John, great to get some time with you. Really appreciate it. John Murphy there, CFO at Coca-Cola.